In the next 45 minutes, I really hope to discuss some assessment concepts, reflect on surgical strategies, review outcomes uh, strategies, and then uh, present thoughts in absence of concrete suggestions for perspectives for the future. What I'm not going to talk about is surgical techniques. Uh, Rod also is going to talk about pelvic screws, and you just saw some great biomechanics. So uh, for Ehlers screws, which we talked with a number of uh, people in the labs yesterday, I defer uh, to actually the cadaver uh, work. And I want to repoint out Paul's statement that these are very soft screws. If you don't put them in right, they're a supplemental screw. And if you miss, uh, you'll hit a vessel such as on the top left. But as an adjuvant tool to uh, swan fixation, they don't cross the joint count of what Paul said, and they're actually very helpful. Uh, iliac screws are obviously a vastly more powerful technique or S2 iliac screws. So that's just a disclaimer that I'm not going to talk about how to put in what hardware. As a general gestalt, the spinal column, which is uh, with its usually 23 discs, uh, 53 joints, is a daunting and amazing structure uh, that in surgery we frequently attest to immobilize. And that's again a biologic and mechanical problem. Um, it frequently leads a lot of people to take a rather nihilistic viewpoint. And again, let me just take this moment to encourage you and congratulate you on your choice to become really good spine doctors. And that is, you're going to change lives. This is one of the most gratifying specialties of all, and um, probably even better than cardiac surgery. Um, it's a phenomenal thing that you can do, and you can truly change lives. We have no idea, there's no written record of this um, uh, 14th century woman who obviously had a major spinal deformity. But these kind of uh, lives you can change, whether it's in our country or in faraway uh, underserved areas. Um, this is a profound thing that you can do with these hardware advancements. And it's a true privilege to have one of the giants in the back here, John Kostrick, who changed lives and changed all of our professions with his insights. In terms of approaching this topic of uh, spine alignment, I want to come up with three different perspectives. I suggest we use those. And again, the key point is that they're not mutually exclusive. So when I'm going through these three phases, please uh, consider them as resemblant and uh, really corollary to one another and not exclusive. What are these three uh, different perspectives? This is a painting by Salvador Dali uh, of his wife, um, uh, the famous Spanish serialist. And again, I thought this was a very fitting topic. This is a geometric uh, um, approach. There's a dynamic approach. And then there's a comprehensive, newer, emerging um, kind of an approach. The geometric approach is very obvious. And uh, I really want to credit the work of the Scoliosis Research Society and, and, and the International Spine Study Group. And we have Chris Shaffrey here also, who's one of the leaders of both organizations who've really uh, taken this topic way beyond the simple cob angles that I grew up with. But in principle, they use three tools, uh, angles, offsets, and ratios, to try to express uh, what is going on in a mathematical uh, geometric formula with the human spine. And I am really not going to threaten um, uh, putting you to sleep by going through all these various angles right now. All of you know those. Uh, they'll be available to you as a resource uh, through links. Um, but I urge you, and it's quite obvious you have to, that you have to know what a pelvic incidence, a sacral slope, and a pelvic tilt is. And again, you have to match those to surgical techniques, and we can talk about those in the labs. So all of you have to know these various uh, formulas and uh, basic concepts now as a core value. Uh, the problem is that these angles tend to proliferate and they take a life of their own. And um, I have a fear that we're probably becoming a little bit over numeric. But the basic concepts, again, the really important uh, um, things that we all have to learn are the sagittal vertebral axis, obviously. And we have to realize how the spine is just magically aligned in its best shape uh, and is going to function well if this alignment is preserved. And as we're trying to translate that into patients, many, many different factors of their patient's well-being, such as, uh, for instance, back pain, neurologic function, and degenerative or structural failures become very obvious. And again, the radiographs are just a final expression of this. Um, the surgical treatments we're going to discuss in our various labs. And again, we have unprecedented abilities to restore a normal alignment uh, with the power of tools. Yet again, a credit to Dr. Kostwick. As we're uh, the beneficiaries of these advanced concepts, uh, it was Dr. Kostwick who really pointed out many, many key concepts, uh, aided by a couple of bottles of wine, and identified the importance of lordosis in the restoration of a normal human profile. 
And spinal osteotomies, again, would not be where we are without his uh, uh, pioneering work. I want to point out one thing that is, uh, for me, uh, one of those breakthroughs in all these various angular concepts, and that is, again, the T1 inclination angle. So all of you know and are probably tortured with uh, pelvic incidence and sacral slope differentiation, but the focus on the T1 inclination angle for me has been one of the biggest insights and breakthroughs over the last five years. And again, credit to uh, Chris Shaffrey, uh, Chris Ames, uh, Justin and the Virginia group. Um, these are really very important insights and we're just uh, getting there now. The reason why this is forgotten for so long, I'm sure, was the conventional x-ray limitations, which basically through shoulder shadows just obscured this important area. And just now we're actually realizing that we're not just looking at the pelvic incidence, but that from the cranium down to our feet, everything is tied together. And alignment and stability, again, is just so important. And you know what? For all of you here, there is so much work to be done here because the definitions that we're having, especially in terms of the cranium to the cervical thoracic junction, are not well defined yet. So all of you with your creative, brilliant minds, think about what we can use as reference angles and what really matters. I think there's a great opportunity right there. No question that there's a huge neurologic component, and the late uh, uh, Charlie Kuntz really deserves a lot of credit for that. He was a former fellow at the UW. Um, uh, he deserves a lot of credit for having identified this correlation of neurologic dysfunction and kyphosis. So that's a very key insight. There is a direct neurologic and physiologic tangent to malalignment. And to, again, re-emphasize the importance, there are multiple different osteotomy techniques that we nowadays have, and we're just, again, emerging into newer techniques, but as you're going through these labs later, I really urge you to try to challenge the faculty with various different techniques and to have them show you how you can match a deformity with these various osteotomy techniques. And each of these osteotomy techniques has different biomechanics, has different anatomic requirements, and offers different geometric um, responses to the deformity that you're trying to correct. There are new emerging uh, techniques, and there's a renewed interest and emphasis in restoring the anterior column through novel, less invasive techniques. And again, this is truly an opportunity for all of you to put hands on and see these emerging technologies or present technologies in their applications. Um, historically, uh, again, we frequently shortened the spinal column, and that had an adverse impact on the neural column. It shortened the neural column. I think I can speak for all of us that now, uh, two decades later, um, trying to maintain the neural column height is actually a value, so not shortening everything. Spinal column and the bony and neural component is a very important factor. Would you agree with that, Paul? Yeah. Yeah. So the, now a couple of limitations to the geometry uh, perspective on the spine. First of all, the sagittal profile just pointed out that it's so very important. But we now realize also, as we're looking at our aging population, that it is actually, sadly, a physiologic phenomenon that we sag forwards, that we fall forwards. Whether this is inevitable or not, we don't know yet, but this is a physiologic phenomenon we really have to contend with. And so, to some degree, it's probably analogous to looking at an MRI scan and demanding that the MRI scan of a 60-year-old looks as perfect as the one of a 16-year-old. It won't. Aging, the graying of hair, the wrinkling, the hair loss, all these are physiologic aging phenomena. So, we may actually find that we have to redefine these sagittal vertebral alignments as we're looking at an aging population. And this is, again, a mother-daughter comparison, uh, just representing how we change over time. The other big problem, and I'm going to reflect on that later in a different uh, perspective, is that we've really struggled for a long time to correlate curve magnitude with quality of life. Mm -hmm. From the earlier studies, uh, especially from Iowa, with over 20-year follow-up, we really had a hard time making a one-to-one -one correlation between quality of life and curve magnitude. What seemed to be such a logical linear relationship de facto actually turned out to be not one. And uh, circumstances are way more complicated than uh, just a simple linear correlation. So the geometric perspective is important. It's a um, prerequisite for all of you as you're going to be spine practitioners, but it's just one dimension. And this one dimension, I had the great privilege of getting exposed to a completely different uh, worldview um, prior to having my fellowship at the University of Washington with uh, Dr. Anderson by a Frenchman. 
And here I'm not going to reiterate all of the things that he said, but we just um, two months ago had one of those historical convergences where Professor Jean Dubusset, the inventor more or less of the 3D perspective of spinal deformities, lectured here side by side with the great John Kostrick. It was a phenomenal experience and again hopefully you'll go to the website of the Seattle Science Foundation and look at the Spine Masters 2015 program and this is just an excerpt. This is the man who's come up with a three-dimensional deformity model of spinal deformity and he's also come up with the ergonomics in it. The balance as he called it or balance is a truly French concept and again goes way beyond the static angular or geometric perspectives. And he also came up with this cone of efficiency uh, represented in his uh, title slide. So this cone of economy was formulated around 1987. And again, this was a major subject of our discussions at uh, Texas Scottish Rite, where I had the great pleasure of uh, assisting Dr. Dubusset for half a year. So this is, again, the dynamic perspective of the spinal column. And it's, again, the basic concept is that we're at our best if our skull, if our ears, more or less, or our foramen magnum is over the C7-T1 um, spinal canal, over the lumbosacral junction, and over our feet. And there's not much deviation in between. And when this is disrupted, such as in this patient here, a whole chain reaction, a predictable chain reaction of malaise will ensue, pulmonary, digestive, mental, and as in depression, neurologic eventually, and in inevitably a progression to a worsening uh, end result. And again, this is uh, obviously something that is multifactorial, and this is one of the problems of a purely spine uh, upright standing kind of a, a angular uh, dimension because there are multiple factors that can lead towards this forward tilt. One of the simplest things is the physical examination. I think in the angular, the geometric perspective, this is frequently overlooked. Looking at a patient, uh, not just as a x-ray uh, target for angle placement, but as a physical being who can move around uh, is very important. And the answer to the question of is the curve flexible or fixed is something that we can, for instance, look at with a recumbent test. And this will show us little things such as hip flexion contractures and knee flexion contractures, and also give us an idea about uh, cervical, thoracic, and lumbosacral angles. So this is a very important, frequently overlooked test. And again, putting a curve to this uh, down to a recumbent test, so I didn't put that slide in, is a very important first cognitive uh, action in this dynamic assessment of the spine balance. Here, my former partner, uh, Ted Wagner, who is a former member of the Swedish faculty also, um, shows the importance of looking at the knees and the hip joints. And this is something that, especially in the neurosurgical world, I think is not well enough taught frequently. These are integral parts of the spine alignment, and you have to be aware of how to look for this pathology. And I cannot tell you how many times I see patients who have been operated on for perceived L3 radiculopathies who, in fact, have a bad hip joint. Paul, were you going to say something? No. You're just stretching your arms? Or were you going to fall? Yeah, uh, that was my next thing. So um, this is, again, uh, just one of those important things, examining patients and actually putting them down supine uh, is a very important component. So the seven points of Jean Dubusset's uh, composite or dynamic balance understanding of the spine have the osseous and the connective tissue uh, integrity present, the columnar mobility and stability, which are two different entities, the muscle strength of the extensor apparatus, the neurology beyond this, and uh, the functional demands of a patient. And again, it was him who came up with this three-dimensional superimposition of the spine uh, segments from the occiput down to the sacrum to try to see and get, get and arrive at a three-dimensional columnar understanding of the spine, such as represented artistically here. And there is an enormous difference in patients in terms of their alignment, and patients who have a good alignment will have a way better well-being than patients who have a significant offset. So that part is now well understood and proven. And it was also the French surgeons who've come up with this more advanced uh, uh, imaging, which offers a comprehensive picture of the spinal column. And I hope that all of us in the not too distant future will have the benefits of such an integrative uh, whole body assessment of spine alignment. One very simplistic view of the global balance came by my partner, or was suggested by my partner, Ted Wagner. I know all of us are kind of struggling with the various lines, but this is a very simple C7-T1 offset axis, which integrates the proximal femur and shows this offset in a very simple formula. So there's no big ratio, there's a simple distance, and it kind of correlates quite well, actually, with the SVA. Um, this is again the so-called Seattle angle, and again this is a very simple, useful tool with which you can also plan your osteotomies quite well. 
One of the big other limitations of the angular concept of spine is predicting the future. And it is so very difficult and remains very frustrating because of the multifactorial nature of our bodies, physiology, to predict how spinal deformities will evolve, not just over the next year, but over the next decade or more. Let me now talk about the third component of uh, assessing the spinal deformity, and that's the comprehensive approach. And what do I mean with that? Well, I'm from Germany, so I like angles, I like precision, uh, but I'm going to introduce you to a German word, which I suggest uh, using as very apropos. It also has a Yiddish connotation to it. It's gestalt. Uh, it means form or shape. And this is something beyond angular uh, components or the dynamic motion component. This has kind of an aura component. If you look at this hunched over figure, this figure is not just hunched over, there's a whole aura uh, around that individual. And I thought this is a good representative picture to try to bring this concept closer to you. What are we talking about? We're talking about the patient himself with their complaints, their activity status and conditioning, their mindset, their nutrition, the social setting and their comorbidity loads. Those are all co-variables that are very important, that very uh, substantively influence the patient's uh, spinal column. And there are two preeminent questions that we really have to face here. One, what actually matters to our patients? And this has been one of the big struggles of the SRS as they're trying to justify, for instance, uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis surgery. What are the patient reported outcomes? How does the functional testing work? And how does the patient satisfaction fit into that? And I can talk to you off uh, uh, the screen later uh, about some of the more recent research that I've done that. These are remarkable entities which, again, don't directly relate to one another. But what matters to our patients obviously should be on the first and foremost front. And it's very important to pick up patient psychopathology, such as probably the bear of this tattoo might be exposed to. The other factor is, what are actual patient concerns about scoliosis? This, and I see a nod, uh, and he's not falling asleep, if Dr. Kostrick back there was long overlooked. We always thought that scoliosis patients would have pain as their main mobilizing thing, so we tried to assess pain differences, but we didn't, in AIS patients, come to a clear conclusion of this. What actually mattered to them frequently is mobility, functionality, or symmetry. In girls, for instance, how does the clavicle, how do the breasts fall? Are they symmetric or not? That's what matters to them. Or fear of uncertainty of their parents, of their peers. How will I look in the future? And the famous Mexican artist Frida Kahlo very nicely presented that with her terrible spine condition after a trauma, which then deformed, <clears throat> excuse me, it was worsened by a uh, polio condition. So she very clearly expressed these various components in her paintings and was a major subject. And I suggested you look at her paintings because it was very evocative from her spine battles. She had 35 spine surgeries, I heard. So, and the other factors, obviously, what matters to surgeons, hospitals, and third-party payers. Patient happiness, complications, cost of care and yield margins the profitability angle, those are very credible points, but they're very divergent from what patients come into. Coming back to this lady again, this is a great example. This is a patient who is not going to do well. She has multiple malalignment problems from a geometric component. Her facial expression, although we had to obviously cut it off largely, is not one that's gonna be very happy. And we have surgical tools. I'm not suggesting that this is the way to do this necessarily now, but we have multiple surgical techniques to straighten out these spinal columns now, and we can make them perfectly straight. Is it a success? Is this gonna be a success? I will say yes, but maybe not. What are the impediments? Of course, the road to this kind of a success may be a very rocky one. And don't read this slide, but again, attempts at trying to identify and quantify the numbers of complications of these major deformity corrections have been very common and very frustrating because it's all over the map. And the uh, SRS, for instance, in this cumulative complications uh, compilation came up with a very large zone of about 30 to 50 percent. And again, throughout history, these numbers kind of evolve around relatively large ranges. And even uh, the probably most uh, advanced until recently deformity center in North America uh, at Wash U, uh, the numbers were relatively stout, but again, seemed to be somewhat reassuring, about 20 percent. We published, after a very thorough review, a complications paper after uh, following patients prospectively and came up with about a 42% major complication rate. We're probably uh, not as good as surgeons as WashU as one interpretation, or our attempt at trying to pick up uh, complications was more diligently performed. 
One paper I would love for you to read is one from our colleagues from Vancouver. I'm, we are a fan and we have a, a emerging closer and closer collaboration with our colleagues up there. And they did a landmark paper. They got a justified award for that in 2011 by NAS. They assessed the risk of major spine surgery in an unprecedented fashion. And they went actually way deeper than we did at UW in terms of trying to assess these. And this is, again, I just want to give you a context some major publications uh, of major spine surgery published by larger bodies such as SRS or Vancouver previously, UW, those are some of the numbers to give you a context. And their new study there in 2011, they came up with a new number far more clear in terms of what complications are. And I'm going to ask you here to raise your hands. What complication rights our uh, Vancouver colleagues found in this prospective study? Raise your hands if you think that the answer is correct for you. Number one, uh, less than 10%. Raise your hands. Anybody? The group dynamic comes out. Number two, 11 to 25%, a quarter of patients. Any hands? Two or three, there's an optimist back there. Thank you, Dr. Oskoyan. That applies to you. Number three, 50%, up to 50%. Any takers? All right. Number four, 51 to 74%. A couple of takers. Number five, over 75%. Show us your hands. Two people. Okay. And the answer is, drum roll, 87%. Over three levels fusion. Now, immediately, our good friends, uh, Marcel Dvorak and uh, Charlie Fisher and Brian Kwan and colleagues went on stage and said, we're probably the worst spine surgeons in the world. But you know what? I think they're the most honest spine surgeons in the world, and they deserve a lot of credit for having been honest to confront this. What are the conclusions of this? Complications are part of major treatments of the spine conditions, and they've been historically always underreported, including in our best attempt in our institution to try to identify these. And a further insight, and this is very pertinent now, uh, to what I'm aiming for in this third, the gestalt component of spine deformities, they're preventable and factual complications. The factual means they're just going to happen whether you try to prevent them or not. So one thing is uh, preventable ones is one of the very big targets as we're addressing the gestalt, the patient himself, educating them, and again, trying to do systems improvements to try to improve the host to minimize risks. The other big fact outside of complications is how do we score patient outcomes? And this has been a very big deal. I touched upon that earlier with the troubles to quantify patient outcomes with the SRS um, uh, in uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis patients. It's been very difficult and challenging. And again, the SRS has now addressed this by coming up with a number of their own outcome scores, which are validated and which help provide a bigger insight, although it's still not perfect. Again, I'll ask for your participation here. Simple premise, patient A, 58-year-old female, pain all over, Asia motor scores normal, no hyperreflexia, no known comorbidities. Pretty ugly curve, I'm gonna spare you the numbers, but they're not pretty. Patient B, 61, pain all over, same exam, hypertension, osteoporosis. The question to you is one of these patients will need surgery and the other one not. Which patient will require surgery? Who thinks that patient A will require surgery? Show your hands. Nobody? Two, three people. Okay, thank you, Rod. Thank you, John. Four people. You join prominent surgeons. Who thinks patient B with osteoporosis hypertension will require surgery? Show your hands. Same surgeons. Who doesn't want to deal with it? Who's asleep? <laughs> Paul Anderson wants to refer them. So the treatment for patient A, massive surgery, double, uh, basically a long fusion. Uh, patient before had severe back pain, uh, unable to be active. And again, these are some of the conventional outcome scores, VAS, ODI, SF35, uh, uh, component scores, physical, mental activity. So a clear improvement from before. The minimally relevant clinical distance, a difference has been fulfilled. Patient B, the one where a small majority wanted to do uh, surgery, was treated non-operatively over a, about a five, six year period at least, maybe longer actually. She was one of my faithful patients. Um, that I followed non-operatively. She's a very happy lady. And again, these were her numeric expressions. Uh, she's just a very happy candidate. If we look at the numerics, 
there's not a big difference. And these are actual numbers out of the chart. So this is one of the problems that we're facing as we're trying to express what we're doing and justify these major surgeries or not in something. Uh, we have a really hard time doing this. And certain politicians really, as they're looking to uh, cancel payments for healthcare funds, may use this as an excuse to not uh, uh, pay for these major surgeries anymore. Well, what's the answer for this? Again, we ourselves have to um, uh, kind of take control of this by looking at the gestalt component of the patient. We have to ask ourselves, what do we promise and what is the reality? And again, uh, frequently we're prone towards promising perhaps too much than what we can deliver. Frequently also don't involve the patients in an engaged fashion before we ever cut on them to try to optimize our results. So one of the very big problems I will suggest to all of you is that we don't have a very good tool armamentarium to express what's actually going on. We have gone eons beyond what we had just a short while ago, but it's still not where we need it to be. And again, the ODI, I'm not going to go into great details, is a classic example of a statistical conundrum where we have a ceiling and a floor effect. So the actual effective numeric range is not 0 to 100, but actually probably about 60 points. So this is statistically and epidemiologically very important. We have a very hard time, and it's a dynamic response rate that patients will have. It also shifts over time. So whenever the great Jeremy Fairbank talks, he acknowledges that very much. This is just a best first effort. Yet again, I'm looking to all of you here in this room to have the brilliance to come up with something more expressive. But this is as good as it gets right now. And it doesn't do our work justice. It's meant for tumor patients and for very significant impacts quite frequently. So as we're looking at these three dimensions, we really need aspects of all of them. We need geometry. We need a dynamic component, and we need a comprehensive assessment of the patient as a vital uh, being, but we still can't express, for instance, their well-being all that well numerically. So what can we do now in terms of advancing forward? We can recognize the gestalt component of the patient, and we can reshape what can be remolded figuratively and literally. We can pick up the deformity. We can pick up the environment of the patient. We need to arrive at a more comprehensive understanding of our patient. We need to probably really intelligently develop targeted therapies for them. This is a very popular word, but I can't imagine a better application in spinal deformities. We need to be way better at risk prediction and have an improved outcomes evaluations. How do we do this? We actually have answers for this. Registries and, uh, again, patient engagement opportunities. I'll give you just two examples. So there are three, four larger registries that are now around, and we're lucky enough in this state to have something called SCOPE, a Surgical Care and Outcomes Assessment Program. We're the only state in the nation that has that. The great Peter Fitzell, right here, from Falun, Sweden, deserves credit because we basically had his permission to take the Swedish spine registry and transfer it to our state. But NQOD and Oberg are, for instance, two other great registries that are underway. So really stay tuned and maybe become uh, engaged in that because the biggest breakthrough in our field in spine is not hardware or surgical techniques, it's large scale data assessment. So this is just some very brief vignettes. We're now over 20,000 patients that are independently of doctor's offices collected. So we have nothing to do with this. Our patients get automatically fed into our data center. And again, we have uh, 20, uh, so we have over uh, half of the hospitals in Washington State now, and we now have ambulatory surgery centers also. And what can we say? Registries help us understand patients better. So these are just small vignettes, and stay tuned because we'll have a whole number of publications coming out. But by participating in a registry, we could actually drop serious adverse events. Why? We had an improved understanding of why certain complications happen. We also contribute to public health. Smoking is a problem. By making this a focus of our register, we actually could drop the number of smokers among spine surgery patients. And the, uh, again, fiscal aspect, our hospitals could drop charges so we could actually lower costs, which is all analogous and fits together in a big picture. The most important thing is that we think that we can arrive at a predictive modeling for patients' outcomes in the future by a number of simple parameters. So this is something that we're really working on very hard. And stay tuned. All these registries, as they're gaining steam, will gain these kind of um, modeling capabilities. We're really striving for is a learning healthcare system where we're not rigidly married to an angle or something like that. We're trying to understand our patients and improve their well-being through a variety of measures. And that includes, and this is the second component, prehab. 
I want to again congratulate our partner Dave Hanscom here for having been one of the early visionaries. And again, he's given you a book, which I think is great in terms of how to approach this. But before we ever cut on a patient, understanding the patient and assessing a number of factors so we can try to make them better. For instance, detox them where possible, nutritionally optimize them, nicotine cessation, psychosocial wellness, and cardiopulmonary fitness are things that we as spine surgeons should promote. And decision-making, that's the patient engagement component, is a very important part, especially in these major surgeries. This is a model that we started at UW, but there are many of these emerging now. This is a freeware. You can go on spinesage.com, and you're not going to get a virus on your computer. But we have a validated risk assessment model based on multiple patients with 21 variables that were clearly validated. We have a surgical invasiveness index so we can marry the type of an anticipated surgery to the patient's risk profile. We can then print that out. It's a very simple thing down to the infection risk. Then print it out, put it in the chart. You have educated this patient specifically right there as to their risk profile. With this, I want to congratulate Rod on having started this great conference together with Spine One. He's being recognized increasingly for this. And thank you all for your attention to this. And hopefully, nobody fell asleep.